This is um, when was this picture taken? That's at uh, Sears. Uh, the man that gave us this picture, they ain't charge us for it because they ain't supposed to take pictures with money in the hand. Uh huh. So he just gave us this picture. Don't supposed to take pictures with money in your hand because that's not their policy to show their pictures. They probably take just regular pictures. Mm. So who's who's this? That's my little daughter, Laquetta. She's three years old. I was in a French quarter that we went to a football game and I went to show her off because I ain't been with her in a while. And I brought her some leather shorts, you know, and a silk little shirt. And I let her wear a gun because she, you know, always fascinated by the, by the gun. Wayne Hardy. One half of the Hardy Boys, Wayne being the youngest and Paul being the oldest out of the two. Now they had a lot of siblings, but the streets knew Wayne and Paul as the Hardy Boys. They was known for hustling and taking hits throughout the city. Now this footage that y'all looking at is Wayne going through his photo album. <laughs> now Wayne, this photo album that he had, bro, this thing was big, bro, and it seemed like he it was filled up with pictures of different females that he messed with, you know. I mean, this photo album was thick, bruh. Now, one of the more interesting photos in this album was a lot of photos that he took with this one particular female. And damn near every photo he took with her, he had his pistol pointed at her. Check this out. So who's this one? This one of my girlfriends. Her name's Sabrina. I call her Bum. You know, she in college. She uh, go to Dilla. She a senior. You know, we went in the French quarters to take some pictures. And we just come, finished coming out from a date. And the picture was showing her that if she mess up, she'd get one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's when I really, I really liked it, her, you know. But what happened? Y'all split up? Nah, we still together. We just, you know, don't talk as much as you know, often as we used to. But you just teasing her with the gun. I mean, if she, yeah, goes her, she goes her own way, you're not going to... Yeah, no. It just was just, you know, a little play thing between her. Because she think I'm some kind of bad person or something. Now, she's the one of your girlfriends that went on and went to college, huh? Yeah. So she's trying to get an education. You proud of her for doing that? Yeah, I'm proud of, I'm proud of all, you know, all the girls uh -huh. who I try to, yeah. you know, help out. Mm -hmm. So you helped her out pretty much? Yeah. Now these dudes' names was ringing bells in the city, you know what I'm saying? They started linking up with the Ballet Boys. Now for those of y'all that ain't from New Orleans, the Ballet Boys was a clique of individuals that ran through the seven wards, you know what I'm saying? They was known for wearing a lot of ballets, you know, a couple of them rapped, and they was known for a few other things, you know what I'm saying? We ain't gonna talk about that, cause some stuff's supposed to just be left in the streets, you heard me? Who are these guys? One of my friend Wilbur, and... There's you, right there. Yeah, in the middle. Yeah. And the two on standing closer to me on the side is all uh, the Ballet Boys, two of the Ballet Boys. Guy with the hat with the glasses on? No, that's my friend Ulysses, the other two that's standing right there. Oh, uh, that's two of the Ballet Boys, the gang members. A lot of people I know have heard of them. Yeah, so by they knowing me and I'm knowing them, we decided to take a picture together. Mm -hmm. Another friend will, but he's not into it. He just wanted just to get in the picture with us. He's just a... Working, you know, you like working. Honest. Same group, huh? Yeah, same group. Just a different picture we took. Switched around. So, <clears throat> the Ballet Boys have respect for the Hardy Boys? Yeah, and we respect those, you know, respect them. And y'all just kind of kept out of each other's way. Yeah, they do their own thing, we do our own thing. Right. Are they thought to be more ruthless, though, or? 
Now we heard it on being ruthless, but it's it's a gang of them and just me and my brother, so they respect us more. They figure out we ain't need no gang to get ruthless, you know, just us two. It was even linked up with the ruling sixties out there in LA. That was in Los Angeles, me and my brother. We just got off the plane. We was uh gonna stay in Inglewood. Is that Paul? That's Lanyo, brother Lanyo. What's Inglewood like? A bunch of gangs. More, most of the uh, rolling sixties uh, live in the neighborhood right on Crenshaw. Now after 14 attempts on his life, on the 15th attempt they succeeded. Wayne Hardy was murdered in the streets of New Orleans in the early 90s. Now his mama requested that the young lady Dawn Dudo, who was filming her two sons around this time, to film Wayne's funeral. She said that's what Wayne would have wanted. Dawn Dudo is a highly regarded artist born and raised in the city of New Orleans. She lost a lot of her work to Hurricane Katrina, which is most likely why I couldn't find a funeral. But she did report that Wayne was buried in a gold casket. Paul Hardy wasn't able to attend his brother's funeral because he was locked up in Orleans, Paris behind one of the most prolific murder for hire cases involving the New Orleans Police Department and an officer by the name of Lynn Davis. Lynn Davis, nicknamed Robocop in the Night War, due to his stocky frame and his aggressive police style. He had a reputation as both a good and a bad cop. He was suspended six times and received 20 complaints between the years of 1987 and 1992. Due to the allegations of corruption within the New Orleans Police Department, the FBI set up a sting in 1994, which caught Davis enforcing a protection racket upon the city's dealers. Davis had come to the attention of the investigators by extorting protection money from a dealer who was an FBI informant. The agents had a lot of evidence but didn't feel like they had enough, so they called in a deep undercover agent by the name of Juan Jackson. Juan Jackson played the role of JJ, a big timer from Miami who was looking for a hub to store his product in between Miami and Houston. JJ set up a meeting with Lynn Davis and his partner on duty Sammy Williams in the Sheraton Hotel in downtown New Orleans. JJ was a real convincing undercover. When Lynn and Sammy entered the hotel room, JJ asked if both of them could strip down to prove that they wasn't bugged or wired up. In return, JJ stripped down himself to prove that he wasn't wired up. I'm telling you, man, this dude was convincing. He even encouraged Lynn and Sammy to check the room to see if it wasn't bugged and wired up with cameras and all of that. Come on, stop, stop, stop. If we didn't get to watch the conversation anyway. Right, right. I ain't on the deal. The whole time it was, the FBI agents did a real good job of hiding all of the cameras and the wiretaps and ended up recording the whole conversation between J.J., Lynn, and Sammy. Before leaving the hotel, J.J. gave Lynn and Sammy cell phones. This was the early 90s. Cell phones was very expensive and not easy to come by. So Lynn and Sammy proudly took those cell phones, which was ultimately bugged. The FBI literally had a main line and was able to record conversations between Lynn, Sammy, and other NOPD officers. After several months of investigation, they finally had the evidence that they needed. But the investigation came to an abrupt halt when one of the agents on duty was reviewing the cell phone wiretaps and overheard Lynn Davidson, who was later found out to be Paul Hardy, having a conversation about the plot to murder Kim Groves. Kim Groves. Kim Groves was a resident of the Nightwall neighborhood that Lynn Davis and his partner Sammy Williams patrolled. On or about October 10, 1994, Groves witnessed Davis' partner Sammy Williams pistol whip her nephew who lived in the neighborhood. Kim was fed up with the two officers. She decided to file a complaint with the NOPD Internal Affairs Department. Even though Lynn Davis wasn't involved in that particular incident, she made sure to let the affairs office know that Officer Davis played a big role in ruling her neighborhood with an iron fist. Davis learned about the complaint on October 12th and called Paul Hardy. Dad, yeah, you talked to the commander at IED, and he said, he's tired of uh, hearing my name and he didn't want to get me. Lynn Davis and Paul Hardy was real cool. Lynn would take Paul to events that was for NOPD officers. He also used to act as security for Paul, riding around following him in his patrol car, making sure he got off of all of his deals throughout the city. Paul Hardy wasn't nothing to play with around that time. 
He had already beat three bodies, and it's a good chance that Lynn Davis played a role in hiding some of that evidence. In one particular incident, Paul stretched out one of his enemies in the middle of the street, parked down the street, waited for the coroners to arrive to make sure he finished the job. When the coroners didn't arrive and the ambulance came, he realized he didn't finish the job, so he followed the ambulance all the way to Charity Hospital, waited for the paramedics to take the victim out of the back of the ambulance, and fired more shots at him to try to finish him off. Lynn Davis and Paul Hardy discussed the plot to execute Kim Groves, with Hardy as the shooter and Davis and Sammy Williams taking care of evidence at the crime scene. Lynn Davis arranged a meeting with Paul Hardy at the police station to view photos of homicide cases. Davis and Sammy Williams then drove to Kim Groves' neighborhood and they patrol cars to search for her. Shortly after 7.30 p.m., Lynn Davis and Sammy Williams picked up Paul Hardy at his home and drove back to Kim's neighborhood so that Hardy could walk around. After taking Paul home, Davis and Sammy Williams went back to Kim neighborhood and searched for her again. Davis became agitated as the evening progressed because Kim hadn't been executed yet. At about 9.45 p.m., Davis called Hardy to complain. At about 10 p.m., Davis and Sammy Williams spotted Kim near her home. Davis pays Hardy. He's looking for something to come down. Oh, there was something going to be coming most likely. About 45 minutes after that, Davis called Hardy again to complain that Kim hadn't been executed yet. He wanted her bad. Paul Hardy, along with two other co-defendants, drove back to Kim's neighborhood in a champagne-colored Nissan Maxima. And at about 11 p.m., Hardy shot grows in the head, instantly killing her. Now, y'all remember them cell phones that J.J. gave Lynn and Sammy? Well, that's the same cell phone Lynn Davis was using to talk to Paul Hardy the whole time. It was all recorded. Now, this recording that I'm about to play for y'all right here is Paul calling Lynn Davis back to let him know that he finished the job. While Lynn Davis was still on the phone with Paul, he hit up the dispatch from his patrol call to confirm it. Now, I want y'all to pay real close attention at how excited that dude was when the dispatch confirmed that it was Kim Groves. What's up? Hey, hey, my son. <laughs> I know, I'm listening. Uh, well, they cool down in it. It's a cold, cold world and the people in it is even colder. Lynn Davis and Paul Hardy were both arrested, tried, and found guilty for the slaying of Kim Groves. Both were sentenced to be executed. Davis would have that sentence overturned when his conviction of witness tampering was thrown out. He was again tried and convicted to be executed in 2005. As of 2022, Davis is a federal death row inmate and is serving out his time in the penitentiary in Indiana. Paul Hardy's execution was later overturned and then sentenced to spend the rest of his life in prison when the judge found him to be mentally disabled. This is just one of the many stories of corruption and violence in the city of New Orleans. Rest in peace, Kim Groves. Until next time, this is Eyewitness Hip Hop, signing off. Holla at me.